Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on NJ Spotlight News. Brianna Venosi is off tonight. I'm Michael Hill. A sigh of relief today for health officials after a weekend of record positive COVID-19 test results. Results topping 6,000 cases for the first time in the 10 months of the health emergency. A big retreat as the governor reports more than 3,500 new infections, putting the nine-month total at 372,000 cases. The state health department reports 17 new confirmed deaths for more than 17,000 total COVID fatalities. The drop in numbers comes on the day outdoor gathering limits drop from 150 to 25 people except for religious and political activities. That's in line with hopes of keeping the slight downward trend heading in the right direction. The governor pointing out that one key to fighting the pandemic is contact tracing, but he says non-cooperation has become a huge issue. Non-cooperation with our contact tracers is now up to a whopping 74 percent of cases. Quite frankly, this is unacceptable and we need folks to turn that around. Remember, our contact tracers are not on a witch hunt. They are only concerned with stopping the spread of this virus. We urge you, please work with our contact tracers and do your part to end this pandemic. COVID-19 cases are soaring in Dover. 1,500 reported infections in the Morris County town of 18,000 residents post Thanksgiving. A rapid spread and so high that it's put police officers on the streets to hand out masks. Joanna Gagas reports. For the COVID, yeah, it's a lot of people because sometimes people live in, in one room, three, four people. It's a lot of people is not working. Is too many people poor. They're always like in parties and all that stuff. So I feel like that's one of the biggest issues. Yeah, I absolutely have a lot of anxiety about it. Um, I've had several family members affected. In this two square mile town of Dover, the coronavirus is running rampant. With nearly 1,500 confirmed cases, this tiny town is leading the pack in Morris County, coming in second only to the much larger town of Parsippany. The town of Dover is predominantly about 70% Hispanic, and we understand that certain racial and ethnic uh, groups have been disproportionately affected. Uh, and we've seen it specifically in our town. Um, I, Speaking from experience, I had COVID and I understand how powerful it can be and we want to do anything we can to help you know, bring awareness and prevent uh, any, any more COVID spread within this town. The police force has taken an active role in educating the community about the dangers of COVID. Good morning, how are you guys? We've had officers out speaking to members of the public, trying to bring awareness, speaking with business owners in town, um, trying to do everything we can to educate them. And then when education hasn't worked, we've been out uh, conducting enforcement operations issuing summons when the warnings aren't heeded. But before they hand out that ticket, officers have been patrolling the streets, handing out masks to anyone who needs it. Here's a mask. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. No, no, you're okay. You're okay. Here. That's for your help. I say, hi, how are you? How are you doing? Um, see, you don't have a mask on. I have a mask for you if you would like a mask. And normally the people always say, yeah, sure, absolutely. Whether they forget the mask or they don't have one. Even though most of the community is mask compliant, Officer Marin says he can hand out up to 100 masks within an hour, pointing to just how busy these small streets can get. Sometimes the young people, they know you the mask. That one is the problem. Not just a problem in Dover, but across the state, as positive tests spiked to over 6,000 yesterday, forcing a stern reprimand from the governor today. When you act like a knucklehead, you show your true self. You show you don't care about your community. You show you don't care about your customers or your employees. You prove that you only care 
about yourself. And the Department of Health warns we won't even be at the peak of the post-Thanksgiving spread until 13 days after the holiday, which would be this Wednesday. But in Dover, having a positive attitude is one way they're avoiding that positive test result. We're not going to here to judge anybody and, you know, maybe they can or cannot afford a mask or find a mask. Uh, so if it's something we can do to bridge that gap, we'll do it. Officers will be out here midday on Tuesday, Wednesday morning, and most of the day on Saturday, handing out masks and urging residents to follow all safety precautions during this busy holiday season. In Dover, I'm Joanna Gagas and Jay Spotlight News. New Jersey is in the midst of predicted spiking COVID-19 infections after Thanksgiving. Among those making such predictions, epidemiologist Stephanie Silvera of Montclair State University. Dr. Silvera joins us again to talk about the virus's recent abrupt increase and the anticipated post-holiday peak a week from today. Hi, Dr. Silvera. You predicted this right before Thanksgiving we spoke and you talked about these numbers spiking. Uh, after Thanksgiving. That's exactly what we're seeing. Why are we seeing this? So unfortunately, for whatever reason, even though the message was out that we shouldn't be gathering with our extended family and friends, it appears that some of that did occur. Um, we know that there have been some incidents at restaurants the day before Thanksgiving or the night before Thanksgiving of young people gathering home from college like we would see on a typical year, but we know that this isn't a typical year. Now, there's a hypothesis that after Thanksgiving, we're going to see numbers get even higher than they are now. What is that hypothesis and why that prediction? So we know that you're not really going to test positive until about five days after your exposure. So if we think of the holiday weekend as starting on the 25th and going through the 29th, the earliest that somebody would be get a positive test would be somewhere around um, the 30th or so. We also know that it takes about two days for those PCR tests to be processed and for you to get the results back. So unfortunately, I think we're only at the very beginning of this post-holiday spike. How much worse do you expect this to get? So I think there's the potential for it to get much worse when we had people gathering over the weekend and then going back to their regular daily lives where they may have gone back to work and may have potentially spread that either in school systems or through their places of employment. So I think, unfortunately, this may be the beginning of a dramatic increase over the next few weeks. Dr. Silvera, we knew what the risks were when we got all these warnings about Thanksgiving. Why are we not heeding these warnings? So I think, you know, we've all heard of the pandemic fatigue and quarantine fatigue. And I've also heard a lot of, well, we deserve this, right? It's been such a hard year. I deserve to get together with my family. And unfortunately, the virus doesn't abide by what you think you deserve. So, you know, we really do need people to stay at home, limit their social contacts. And when you absolutely have to be around people that you don't live with, wear your mask. I just, I think there's a lot of resistance to what we know will help. Dr. Stephanie Silvera, Montclair State University. Thank you once again, doctor. Thank you, have a good day. Newark's Mayor Raz Baraka says early data from the 10-day lockdown shows the city's COVID positivity rate was lowered but dropped dramatically in the Ironbound District. The lockdown began the day before Thanksgiving and ended three days ago on Friday. It advised residents to shelter in place and only go out for essentials. The mayor says the city shut down 53 businesses during the lockdown for violating state orders but was encouraged by the numbers of people who got tested. He's issued a new holiday plan advisory for gatherings, visiting Santa and going caroling. Big decisions this week on coronavirus vaccines, with New Jersey anticipating getting enough of Pfizer's serum initially for some 76,000 doses. Who should get the vaccine first has an evolving answer. Health reporter Lilo Stanton joins us now to talk about this. Thanks for joining us, Lilo. So this answer, it's an evolving one. Who's going to get the vaccine first? Hi, Michael. Yeah, so so originally the uh, intention was to focus on six, what the state estimates to be about 650,000 frontline healthcare workers, paid and unpaid, working in all kinds of different capacities, but at risk for uh, catching the coronavirus. Um, it also included EMTs. These people would be, you know, at nursing homes, all kinds of facilities. But uh, late on Friday, they suggested that they were going to 
to another 75,000, which includes um, the residents of long-term care facilities, nursing home, assisted living, things like that. And that's based on a recommendation from the CDC last week um, that suggested that both of those groups should really be part of the first priority uh, phase when we come to these vaccinations. So that's that's what we have the state to focus on now. It's more than 700,000 people. Um, it's not clear who exactly would go first, but that's from from what I last heard, their most priority, their their intention for prioritizing. Is there a perception that some people, at least initially, are going to be left out who should be prioritized? Well, you know, I've seen um, I've seen pushes from groups that represent frontline workers, right? So grocery store workers. Um, think about bus drivers. You know, this was a group that was particularly at risk. Um, you will get a you know a huge percentage of your frontline workers are also represented by individuals of color. So that's a group that was hard hit demographically for a variety of reasons by COVID nineteen. So there is pressure to do that. Um, I think what the state is really trying to communicate is that they're going to be a very small number at first, but then the supply will grow sort of exponentially over the weeks. And so hopefully by the time that, you know, enough people really want the vaccine, there's also a question of how many people are going to want it, um, that there will be that capacity on hand. So it may take a couple of weeks to get up to speed, but it should be there is what the state is suggesting. All right, great. Thank you. Lilo Stanton, our health writer. Thank you, Lilo. Thank you. The U.S. House of Representatives voted late last week to decriminalize marijuana and expunge nonviolent marijuana convictions. But the bill is not likely to get approved in the Senate, where Republicans hold a majority. On Friday, New Jersey moved a big step closer to a framework for marijuana legalization. As a January 1 deadline looms, the governor and legislative leaders agreed on how to address restorative justice and other issues. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports. As the fulfillment of one of the governor's major legislative initiatives, it was a bit of a letdown to see the news of an agreement get dumped late on a Friday like an unpopular tax hike. We've reached an agreement on legislation providing the framework for legalization, read the statement, more whimper than bang. <laughs> well, you know, we were very close, David. As you're aware, there was only a few items that were outstanding. Some of it came, came from the Senate's version. Some of it came from the Assembly version. And uh, I think uh, we'll get it done next week now, just like I predicted. The ink's still wet on the bill that sets up the industry guidelines, but so far it looks like there will be a cap on the number of growers. They're capped at 37, a number that sunsets after two years. The sales tax will be 7%. Towns can add a 2% local tax. 70% of the sales tax money would go to social justice programs. The rest will fund the Cannabis Regulatory Commission and training for so-called drug recognition experts. There'll also be a social equity fund fed by a sliding tax on growers. All of that money would go to communities negatively impacted by the war on drugs. Not in the announcement on Friday, but equally agreed upon, say sources, was agreement on a companion decriminalization bill. I've agreed to allow for the psilocybin amendment to come out into a separate piece of legislation with the assemblies moving today. Uh, and those bills will be voted on separately. It'll come back to us for... Uh, for consideration, and then it'll go to the governor's desk. Not complete certainty. There's still some question about what the tax rate should be, um, where that money should be allocated specifically, and some of that isn't going to get answered until we go through the budget process. The bill also allows for an unlimited number of micro licenses to be administered by the regulatory commission, and which supporters hope will clear the way for smaller operators to get into the business without major overhead like a major cultivator would need. So let's see this innovation. Let's allow these uh, uh, commissioners and their staff to start working on the details. Let's get some licenses out there. When we were in Colorado, the people in Colorado looked at New Jersey and said, you could probably create 43,000 direct jobs. That's what I want out of this. I want a regulated industry with a safe product that employs 43,000 people. Still to be ironed out is how employers would handle off-hours use by their employees. And there's talk now of another constitutional amendment that would formally dedicate where tax monies would go. 
but that's a matter for another day. Compromise bills, once they're written, would get hearings on December 14th, and a final vote, for real this time, could take place on December 17th. I'm David Cruz, and Jay Spotlight News. The state of New Jersey recently filed a lawsuit against Academy Bus, accusing the company of defrauding New Jersey Transit out of $15 million by underreporting the trips it missed and charging for ones that never ran. One result, a chorus of demands for more oversight. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Bus riders repeatedly tweeted their frustration. Academy bus a no-show again. Call up whoever runs Academy bus service and ask why three buses didn't show. Turns out the riders were on to something. New Jersey's Attorney General recently charged Academy with defrauding NJ Transit out of $15 million for bus routes it allegedly ignored since at least 2012 until a whistleblower set off warning flares. To have buses that don't show up um, is, is something that's just not acceptable. Tri-State Transportation's Janet Chernitz complains that NJ Transit's board wasn't briefed on Academy's no-show problems before it unwittingly approved a new contract with the company, a contract Governor Murphy promptly canceled. She agrees. And that's definitely the right move and the right start, but we need to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. This item should not have been presented to the board to start with. Um, and certainly the board needed to have the full information in order to, to vote properly. The attitude tends to be when you question them is circle the wagons. You know, there's this lack of transparency. Advocate Len Resto says NJ Transit badly needs a total overhaul. He started a change.org petition to fire the agency's executive director, Kevin Corbett, plus remove its board chair, Diane gutierrez Cachetti, who's also Jersey's transportation commissioner. What you need there are professional transit people to run that organization as opposed to political appointments. So instead of circling the, the wagons, they should be taking these problems that are brought to them seriously. Senator Loretta Weinberg's co-sponsoring a bipartisan bill to shake up NJ Transit. It says board members, not the governor, should hire the executive director, a separate customer advocate, and an auditor general, and also elect the board's chair. It requires the agency to report all financial audit documents in a centralized database, and it establishes strong legislative oversight. I would like to make sure that there is an auditor who reports directly to the board. And again, so that these kinds of issues around Academy bus are done in public. We are um, uncovering things. Uh, in the case of this Academy bus issue, uh, unfortunately, uh, it was uncovered by an outsider. There was information within the organization that should have been shared with, with the board. And personally, I'm, I'm upset about that. Recently appointed NJ Transit board member Bob Gordon backs Weinberg's bill, but does see a conflict with a transit board director who's also New Jersey's transportation commissioner. Department of Transportation is in the, the business uh, of, of building roads. And, uh, you know, that conflicts with the uh, resources allocated to mass transit. But the governor called Gutierrez Cachetti a star. She is exactly where she needs to be, and I am thankful every single day for her service to our state. Academy says it'll file court papers that detail its good faith efforts to perform the service in issue and to properly tally and submit missed trip information to New Jersey Transit. A transit spokesman says it's keeping closer tabs with automated exception reports that are produced for scheduled trips that didn't operate using the GPS technology installed on our buses. We augment that with staff reports. NJ Transit's board meets Wednesday. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. New Jersey business owners are running out of time to save a ton of money on much needed PPE to help keep their businesses open. Rhonda Schaffler has the details in today's top business stories. Rhonda? 
Michael, Governor Murphy today reminded small businesses in need of personal protective equipment of an important deadline this week. Businesses and nonprofits with 100 or fewer employees can apply for nearly 70% discounts on PPE purchases through the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. But to get those discounts, they must apply by this Thursday. PSCG recently announced it would acquire a 25% stake in Orsted's offshore wind farm. But the interest in clean energy is not just limited to big companies. The Murphy administration is getting set to roll out programs next year that would benefit smaller startups focused on clean technology. The EDA is partnering with the New Jersey Commission on Science, Innovation and Technology on this effort. Judith Sheft is the commission's executive director. It's really to help drive the innovation associated with the clean energy master plan and help drive innovation from early stage entrepreneurs. One of the new programs would provide those entrepreneurs with grant money. Applications will be made available early next year. PSCG and Orsted are funders of NJ Spotlight News. It's the holiday season, so that means scammers are in full force. Some people are receiving fake phone calls about their Amazon accounts. Recorded messages claim an order is lost, can't be filled, or there's a suspicious purchase. The calls sound like this. An unauthorized purchase of an iPhone XR 64 gigabytes for $749 is being ordered from your Amazon account. The Federal Trade Commission says the scammers then try to get personal information from their victims. A break for student loan borrowers. The U.S. Education Department has extended the freeze on student loan payments until the end of January. The freeze was supposed to end on December 31st. Now here's a check on trading on Wall Street. I'm Rob Schaffler and those are your top business stories. The FBI raided an Atlantic County lab and urged those who recently went there for a COVID test to get retested somewhere else and as soon as possible. Officials won't say why, and that adds to the anxiety of the federal advisory. Raven Santana has that and the raid the feds carried out. Careful. This is exclusive video obtained by NJ Spotlight News from a resident who frantically recorded the FBI raiding the Infinity Diagnostic Laboratory in Vetner last Thursday. I took pictures of my Hello. photos taken during the raid show a handful of agents surrounding the lab, which is now being investigated for allegedly offering a rapid finger prick COVID test. The FBI released this statement. As stated on the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's website, rapid finger prick blood tests for COVID-19 are antibody tests and should not be used for diagnosing active cases of COVID-19. Only a test that uses a nasal swab or saliva should be used to diagnose active cases of COVID-19. If you were recently tested for COVID-19 at Infinity Diagnostic Laboratory located at 6715 Atlantic Avenue in Ventnor, New Jersey, you are urged to be retested as soon as possible. From here. I had the prick, but then a couple days later, I went back and got it swabbed to make sure I was negative because I wasn't too sure about that blood test. It's terrible. It, t it could make me cry. One woman I spoke with who did not want to be identified on camera says she got tested here just last week. What prompted you to come here? I'd work up the street. So everybody was looking for a place to go and this was it. Do you know what I mean? The woman that worked there was friendly and nice. My grandson went here. My uh, son-in-law went here. It was a cash business. Was that weird? Very, very. But when you're desperate, not desperate, but when you want to know something. You know, another point is, if you don't have insurance. Attractive. The way to go, exactly right. And I agree with that 100%. According to the owner of the building who showed up here, the lab was operating a little over a month before it was raided. Don't know what happened here. Uh, they've only been here, I think, about six weeks. But no one was answering the clinic's door today. After multiple attempts to reach someone from the lab for a comment, we have yet to hear back from them. I was very surprised that something was not quite right. Uh, I thought they were uh, nice people and they were authentic. I saw the advertisement and I took advantage of it. I was afraid what they were not legitimate and might be giving you 
the results of the tests that weren't true. I was concerned, that's why I come down today to look at it. The public information officer for Atlantic County released a statement saying, the Atlantic County Division of Public Health is cooperating with federal and state officials, but has had no involvement with any testing or activities provided by or performed at Infinity Diagnostic Laboratory in Ventnor. The FBI is now asking anyone who was recently tested with a finger prick blood test at the site to contact the agency as their responses would be useful in a federal investigation. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. That does it for us tonight. Head over to njspotlightnews.org where we'll continue to cover the stories affecting the Garden State. I'm Michael Hill, in for Brianna Venosi. For the entire news team, thanks for being here and have a safe night. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the social service and nonprofit pioneers who lend a helping hand. Science and technology innovators. The men and women who provide our skilled labor and our homegrown champions, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. If you need to see a doctor, RWJ Barnabas Health has two easy ways to do it from anywhere. You can see an urgent care provider 24 seven on any device with our telemed app, or use our website to book a virtual visit with an RWJ Barnabas Health medical group provider or specialist, even as a new patient. You've taken every precaution, and so have we. So don't delay your care any longer. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.